Welcome to PM Center's USA's webinar on getting started with Agile. The slides you have been viewing are an executive overview of the services of PM Center's USA. Today's presentation will be given by Joe Lucas, PM Center's USA's Vice President. I'm Justine Volner, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. If you experience any audio or technical trouble, please be sure to turn up the volume on your computer's control panel. If that doesn't help, then please click the Audio Wizard button in your toolbar to check your settings. I posted a link to our FAQ webpage in the chat box if you need further assistance. To help you gain the most from this experience, please type in any questions you have about this webinar. To type in a question, select the text chat button in your toolbar, type in your question, and select all presenters in the Send To drop-down menu. We will be having a question and answer session at the end of this presentation to answer any questions that were submitted during the webinar. We also encourage you to tweet your thoughts about today's webinar by using the hashtag PMCentersUSA. Our talk on getting started with Agile is based on the experience of Joe Lucas, Vice President of PM Centers USA. Joe is a recognized expert in project management subject areas such as risk management, scheduling, estimating and earned value, and is a frequent guest speaker for companies and organizations across the country. Today's presentation will run about 30 minutes long and will be followed by a brief question and answer session. But now, let me turn the presentation over to Joe. All right, thank you, Justine, and let's get started. What we're going to cover today are four topics. I'll give you a brief introduction to what Agile is all about. And I will talk about what are the different methodologies that fall under the Agile umbrella. We will spend a little bit of time talking about Scrum because that is probably the most popular and well-known uh, Agile methodology in use today. And I'll finish up discussing some potential scenarios, ways to organize projects to incorporate Agile. So let me ask you a question. How many people have worked or are working on an Agile project? Uh, show of hands, check mark. How many people? Okay, we got some putting their hands up. Tammy, Sean, Carol. So we got a few people who have worked. I see Jay. So we've got at least a few. Okay, good. All right, let's start with a definition of Agile, and the definition I'm showing here talks about the fact that it is a group, not, not a, a singular, but a group of development methods. And the key words are iterative and incremental development. And the other key part, requirements and solutions evolve over the project. Totally different from a waterfall environment where you define requirements up front, you design the solution to meet those requirements, and then do the build. With Agile, the requirements and the scope basically evolve over the life of the project. So it is what we call an iterative framework, and Agile, in my opinion, very appropriate for things like product development and also for custom build software. Uh, Agile, in my opinion, is not appropriate if you're doing a design construction project, for example, a new office building or you're building a laboratory for a pharmaceutical client. But there are some Agile techniques that can be applied to those projects. Now, that's beyond the scope of today's webinar, so I'm not going to cover that today. But again, be aware that, yeah, there are some things that are what we'll call best practices in Agile that can be applied to even waterfall projects. Now, there's, there's other definitions out there on Agile. And if, if you do a search on the internet, you're going to find a lot of different definitions. And there's some good ones and some bad ones. Um, one that I found says agile processes 
are iterative and employ specific project management and engineering practices to sustain the delivery of new functionality every one to four weeks. Not a bad definition, but the problem with this definition are the words specific project management techniques. That's um, not good because the whole point with Agile is it depends on the project. So specific project management techniques, no. You're going to do what's necessary to make that job successful. That's the key. All right, let's move on and talk about what Agile is and isn't. As I said before, it is an iterative framework. And quite frankly, Agile are ways of getting projects done. So it's a project life cycle. Now, I find it interesting, there's some books out there and they, they talk about project management life cycle. Well, there is no such thing, okay? There isn't. You apply project management to all life cycles. I don't care whether it's waterfall or an iterative methodology, but there is no such thing as a project management life cycle. That, that's a misnomer and I've seen this in textbooks. No, I mean, there are project life cycles out there and you apply project management to those life cycles. And with Agile, it, it does not ignore project management. I, I saw one article where it says, well, Agile is an alternative to project management. Well, that's that's not true. Absolutely false. You, you apply project management to all projects. With Agile, I call it project management light. You're not ignoring it, but you're not doing a lot of things you might do on a waterfall type project. A little history on this. Again, iterative development, quite frankly, it's been around for a long time. And it really started not with software, but with product development. And a guy by the name of EA Edmonds introduced adaptive software. Uh, this was back in 1974. And um, lightware software development methods evolved in the mid 90s. And again, that was a, a reaction to what was called the BDUF, big design up front. And, and, and back then, there were some big, big IT projects being done, um, multiple year projects, and they were failing because you're doing all this waterfall stuff, requirements, and then the design and build. And, and things change. So that's why I said Agile is very appropriate for software development because things change. And especially if you have a job of any size, it's going to be over a year long. In my opinion, on a custom built software, you're going to fail unless you're using an Agile technique. Back in 2001, some software developers got together in Snowbird, Utah, and they published the Agile Manifesto. And the key part were the values. And it was all about developing software in better ways. And what they said was that they, that they valued individuals and interactions over process and tools. Number two, working software over comprehensive documentation. Uh, number three, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And the last one, responding to the change over following a plan. Uh, here on slide eight, I'm talking about the Agile principles that were also developed as part of the Agile manifesto. I know some of the key words, customer satisfaction by rapid delivery of useful software. Uh, number two, welcoming changing requirements. Note even late in development. Uh, delivering software frequently, weeks rather than months. And the software is a measure of progress, not the number of tasks completed. Uh, sustainable development, i.e. a constant pace of getting work done. 
number six talks about the daily cooperation. So the business people, developers are working together. It's not adversarial. And sometimes people say, well, at Waterfall is all about throwing things over the fence, more adversarial. Well, it, it doesn't have to be that way, quite frankly. But uh, here, here on slide nine, the other principles, face-to-face -face conversation. So co-location. Now, again, you can, and I'll mention this later on also, you can actually do virtual agile teams. They, they can work. Co-location, always better. But, yeah, you can make it work with a virtual situation. Motivated individuals, well, that's true for any project, in my opinion. Attention to technical excellence, good design. Again, okay, why, why agile? That applies to any project. Simplicity. Uh, Self-organizing teams, again, this is really referring to the teams have more control over the work they're doing as opposed to a top-down approach from a project manager. And then adaptation to a changing circumstances. Again, get, get what that gets into, especially with custom-built software, and even product development, because I've done product development jobs, uh, things change. Market conditions change or some new technology that comes out. So you have to be nimble as a team and be able to adapt to those changing circumstances. All right, now, why Agile, the business case for it? Well, yeah, there's a, a book, and I'm going to give you a list of books at the end that are pretty darn good books to read about Agile to learn more about it. But the business case is all about delivering early and often. And the example in this one book said, well, you got a two-year project. Waterfall, nothing's released to the end of year two, no revenue, just cost during those two years. And the book goes on to say, well, if you do it at Agile, you could have a release each quarter, and therefore you're generating revenue for one and a half years before the Waterfall project. Okay, yeah, valid point, but here's my point. Uh, who would be that dumb to do a, a project that's going to take two years before you have anything in production. That, that just not going to happen. What's going to happen is, quite frankly, and I've, I've, I've done this, I've seen it done, is what's called an incremental waterfall. Uh, basically, phase one, release some functionality. Phase two, release more functionality. Phase three, release more. So even waterfall can use an incremental approach. And I'm not going to get into it today. We don't have time, but but quite frankly, you, th there are some pretty darn good hybrid models you can use combining Waterfall and Agile. And I think as time goes on, you're going to see more of these hybrid models popping up and getting used, taking advantage of the best practices of both the Waterfall methodology and the Agile approach. Now, the other thing about Agile, uh, it, it, it's not a cure-all. It is not. Uh, you, again, you go back to the triple constraints on projects. You, you can't have it all. Um, normally with Agile, uh, you, you don't have fixed scope. You, you usually have a fixed date. You have fixed resources. And with Agile, the scope evolves. So the requirements, the scope, over the iterations evolves. Now with waterfall, uh, normally you try to put everything in place at the beginning. You have an end date you're shooting for, perhaps you're putting the budget together, the resources and the scope to finding all that out. So the, my point is you can't have all three. Agile is not a silver, silver bullet. If somebody's trying to define the scope for you and tell you, I need all of these things here, and by the way, here's the cost, here's the date, here's your resources, Agile is not going to save you. Basically, you're probably going to sign up to fail. So be careful. So when, when does Agile make sense? Well, here's some examples where I think it makes a lot of sense to use Agile. New business processes or products. So again, product development in particular. Any place where you have evolving requirements. If you can't define the requirements up front, then don't try to use a waterfall. It's not going to work. So you need an agile approach. 
Number three, if you're using an experimental approach, you just don't know. We've got to do some experimentation to see what's going to work. Then that's probably an agile situation. If you're using new technology, that's a good place to use agile. Then the last two, again, if the client is willing to support what we call the product owner role, that means actively involved in the project, Agile can make sense. If, if, they, if they won't do this, then Agile won't work. And the last one, you do need an experienced team. You need a team that can manage itself. And if you don't have that, Agile is not going to work. So these are some guidelines of where Agile can make sense. All right, let, let's talk briefly. And again, this is going to be a real quick introduction to the methodologies that are under the Agile umbrella. As I mentioned, I will spend more time on scrums. I'm going to come back to it. But the other ones I'll just briefly mention. All right, Scrum. Again, this is an iterative incremental development method. It can be used with software or product development. Uh, this goes way back to 93. Jeff Sutherland was the one who started uh, this concept. Ken Schwalbe used the same basic ideas right around the same time period. So uh, this goes back quite a ways. Uh, Kanban, a little bit different. It actually started in Japan and um, around quality production systems, so the Toyota production system in particular. And, and basically, Kanban, by definition, is a scheduling system for lean and just-in-time production. And agile practitioners are actually adopting the Kanban ideas, lean manufacturing ideas to agile approaches. I, I do mention a book here, Tom and Mary Popperdink, Lean Software Development. They talk about Kanban and do a good job covering what it's all about. The difference between a Kanban and Scrum, a Scrum, and I'll, I'll get into this more later, has a fixed development time box. It could be two weeks or four weeks. A Kanban does not. There is no fixed time box. What Kanban is all about is the flow. And here's what I'm showing with this slide 17 planned in development and testing and done. And you can notice on the left side, the to-do the to -do list. Well, the, the point is simply this. With a Kanban, you limit the work in progress. That's WIP, W-I-P, at each step. So if you see from this example, we're saying we can't have more than four um, things we're working on in the plan process. In development, no more than three. In testing, no more than two. So, so basically, if, if you have something in the to-do list, you can't move it to plan until you clear out one of those four that are there already. In the same way, you can't go from plan to in development until you clear out one of those ones that's un, in progress right now. So the done column is basically a holding pen before moving to the next step because you have the limits on WIP. So this is the whole idea behind a Kanban, is measuring, monitoring the flow from one step to another one. Uh, another agile methodology, extreme programming. Um, the big, big thing about extreme programming is in that second bullet, programming in pairs, test-driven development. Now, the other thing I'll say is this. When you start using something like Scrum or Kanban, you, you, you can employ uh, ideas and techniques from extreme programming. So it's not unusual to see perhaps a Scrum project where they're using like programming in pairs. So you can combine agile methodologies together. Uh, two other ones I'll just mention briefly, dynamic systems development method. 
This uses what's called the Moscow prioritization of scope into must, shoulds, coulds, won't haves, because again, you're dealing with a time constraint. Uh, Feature-driven development, the short iteration process, you have your develop overall model, build a feature list, plan, design, build by feature. So again, just different variations on agile methodologies. All right, what I do want to do is spend some time talking about Scrum, because this is probably the one that gets used most often, most prevalent in today's IT custom built software world. So we will spend a little time talking about it. Um, and basically, this just shows the framework for Scrum. I'll talk about what user stories are in a second. It's basically requirements. You have a backlog, and you, you plan your sprints. Um, so basically, the, the, the way this thing works with Scrum, you have sprints that could be anywhere from two to four weeks. And you're, you're developing functionality during each sprint. So you're working on some features with each sprint. During the sprint, we'll talk more about this daily Scrum. The team gets together, sees how we're doing. Uh, at the end of the sprint, there's a review with the customer to talk about, here's what we did, get your feedback on it. And then a retrospective where the team says, well, what worked, what didn't work, what should we change on the next sprint to get be more effect, effective? So it, it's basically um, a loop. All right, let, let's get into a little more detail on Scrum. And the first thing I want to say is, is some, simply this, is that when, when you deal with agile methodologies, there, there seems to be a, this misconception that there's no planning. I mean, that's the whole idea behind it. Hey, we don't have to plan. We can save all this time. Instead of wasting time planning a plan together, we're just going to go do work. Well, that's not true. Not true at all. There's actually five levels of planning that get done, e even with an agile. Um, the first is what's called the product vision. What is it we're trying to accomplish? What do we want this product to be? Number two is a product roadmap, and that, that's basically the releases. Um, when will we release functionality? So release maybe by quarter, as we're showing in this example, maybe every half year. And then there's a more detailed release plan. How many iterations? What's going to get done during those iterations? What's well, high-level planning? And then number four is the iteration plan. So for specific sprint, what are we going to do this sprint? What work can we accomplish? And then basically there's a daily plan. The team gets together and talks about, okay, what are we going to do today? What's going to have, have to get done? Um, how are we doing at getting the work done? Are we on schedule, behind? So my point, there are planning that is done on Agile projects. So it just looks different from a waterfall. And a good example I'll use, and we don't have time to show the examples today, but schedule. Um, Agile projects, the schedule looks a lot different. It's a lot simpler. A lot less detail to it compared to a waterfall project. All right, now, one of the key issues with Scrum is this thing called the product backlog. Ba basically, the product backlog evolves. Its content changes. New items emerge based on customer and user feedback and they get added to the product backlog. Existing items in the backlog can be modified, reprioritized, refined, or even removed if we decide it's no longer needed. So the whole idea is the team working with the product owner manages this backlog and decides what's going to get done during each sprint. So this, this is basically the work that needs to get done on the project. And what should happen is that this backlog should be prioritized. Because again, the idea with Agile is you work on the highest priority features. 
you don't work on the low value. And then as new requests come in, they get prioritized and put, you know, near the top or bottom, depending where they how they fall out. So this is all controlled by the product owner, the customer, deciding what, what's most important to me. Now, the product backlog consists of uh, different things, but one of the major things it consists of is what's called user stories. And a user story is, is pretty simple. It's, a, it's a, a real simple statement written from an end user's perspective. And the format I'm showing here is pretty common. As a user, I want to do something so I get value. I mean, it's not required that you use this method, but it it works. I've used it. I think it works really well. I'll give you some examples. As a reports admin, I wish to add reports to a batch so that I can save time each month. Or as a seller, I want to display an option for a buyer to buy my product now so I get paid right away. Or as a Facebook user, I want to update my profile so that potential friends may find me. You can use some ideas. Now, the product backlog will have a lots of user stories, but not exclusively user stories. There will be also non-functional requirements. There can also be transition requirements in there. So it's going to be a mix. But the biggest proportion of it will be the user stories. As far as roles, on a Scrum project, there's there's really a few key roles, and the first one is the product owner. And, and what I said earlier is is if you don't have a client willing to commit a person to be that product owner, Agile won't work. So the product owner is responsible for maximizing the benefits of the project. And the owner, the product owner, controls the priority of items in the backlog. Product owner is also responsible for keeping the eyes on the vision, what we're trying to accomplish. And it, it, it is a demanding role on a scrum team because, again, you've got to look at the work being done and say, yep, this is right, no, it's not right. You, you've got to be, again, as a client, talking to people within your organization on the requirements, what do we need, you got to be working with the uh, project team around what's getting done. Uh, it, it's not always a full-time job, but it can be close to it. And the second role, which is kind of critical, is the one of the uh, Scrum Master. And this is different from a project manager. A Scrum Master is a coach, facilitator, and, and they remove roadblocks. So the Scrum Master will guide the team through the Agile process. They, they have to know um, how scrums work. But the key is it's not the team boss. Again, that's a, that's a difference. It's a facilitator role, coaching role, not a tell people what to do role. That, that's a big difference. And then third is you have team members. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Again, they're responsible for doing the work. And again, the key word there is self-managing. And the role of the Scrum Master is to protect them. So let's assume they're working on a um, Scrum and the resource manager wants to pull them for a few days to handle a production emergency. Well, the Scrum Master is, is, is the person that's going to say, with well, time out, that, that's not right. You can't do that. So the, the ones that have to protect the, the team and protect the integrity of the sprint. Uh, externals, again, uh, on a scrum, there, there can be a project manager, but the project manager is not really part of that core team. Uh, there can be sponsors and there can be other stakeholders involved, but the point is the scrum team is usually five to seven to nine in that range. Uh, that includes the developers, testers, the scrum master, the product owner. So it's a small focused team to handle the work of the project. 
All right. Now, again, as I said, um, if you're doing a scrum, there is project management being applied. The sprint is the basic unit of development. Now, a sprint can be a week. It can be two weeks. It can be a month. So it's called the time box, a constant length. It, it should not change from sprint to sprint. So if you're, if you're doing a project using Scrum, uh, it, each one of those sprints should be the same, two weeks or four weeks, but pick a, pick a duration and it should stay constant. Now, what I'm showing here is a typical sprint, and let's assume it's a one-week sprint. Uh, Monday, you would have a sprint planning session. It, it would probably be two hours, and you'd talk about, okay, what are we going to get done this week? What what items of the product backlog can we sign up to do that we can commit to finishing by this week? And then each day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, there'd be a daily scrum. That's a quick meeting first thing in the morning where you talk about um, what are we doing today, um, what was accomplished yesterday, and then what roadblocks are out there that I need help with. You'll notice I also talk about this thing called story time. That's usually in the middle of the sprint. And, and what that is, it, it's looking at the backlog and starting to think about the next sprint and, and basically looking at the top of the priority list and say, okay, what, what's there? Uh, if, if it's a, an item that's too big, let's let's start breaking it down. So you're starting to look ahead to the, what, what's going to happen in the next sprint. And then at the end of the sprint, again, assuming the five-day sprint here, you'd have a demo, and you would show the working functionality to the product owner and other key clients and get their feedback, their reaction to it. And then there would also be a retrospective where you talk about what worked, what didn't work, what we're going to do different for the next sprint. Now, Again, this is a one-week sprint. Let's assume you had a, um, a one-month sprint. That planning session would probably be at least four hours, for example. The daily scrum would still be 15 minutes. Uh, the story time, that might be a half-day session. The demo might be an hour, an hour and a half, two hours maybe. And the retrospective might be a couple of hours. So, again, the length of these meetings depend on how long the sprint really is. Uh, the sprint planning meeting, this is kind of key because this is where you figure out what we're going to do. So you do this right at the beginning of the sprint, and the eight hours, well, yeah, if you had a one-month sprint, you'd probably have an eight-hour time box for that. But if it's going to be a one-week, you're probably talking a couple hours. If it's a two-week, it's probably four hours at most. And what happens during this planning meeting, the product owner, We'll introduce the backlog items, the top items, and the team will ask questions to understand what what that product owner is looking for. And then the part two of the meeting, the team will analyze their capacity and decide on what we're going to do on this sprint. What what tasks can we take on? How many hours? Who's going to own it within our team? So you're basically planning the sprint. So the input is your product backlog, the prioritized items. The output is basically a sprint backlog and a team commitment that we're going to try to get this work done. Now, two of the key artifacts when you have a scrum, uh, number one is this task board. And what that's doing, if you, if you look at the headings there, it, there's the stories we're working on to do, what's in progress, what's in testing, and then what's completed. So it's basically showing where we are with the tasks for the sprint. And the second is what's called the burn down chart. And, and what that is showing is the, the tasks in the product backlog and how many are left to be done. And you'll notice the little bars in there, the completed tasks, it shows how many were completed per sprint. So, again, that's just a, two tools that get used uh, on Agile projects. All right, final topic. Let's talk about some different project scenarios. Um, 
I've, I've actually have heard of a couple client organizations making the comment that we're going to go all agile, all our jobs will be agile. Well, my opinion, that's not very smart because, as I said at the beginning, there are certain projects it makes sense to use a waterfall approach and certain projects where an agile approach is more sensible. So it really depends on the project. What I believe organizations need is, number one, a waterfall methodology, and then number two, an agile methodology, and number three, uh, the ability with, for the project managers to develop a hybrid model, taking the best of both, if the project warrants that approach. All right, so let's, let's look at some specific scenarios you might have. And the first one is this agile project. So it's a simple, straightforward project. You've got one scrum team, just that's it, one scrum team. So you've got a scrum master, you've got a product owner, you've got maybe seven, eight people on the team. All right, you, you might have a project manager still to deal with the corporate environment in that situation. So they may be reporting to management on the project, how things are going, because you don't want the scrum team or the scrum master wasting their time doing that because that's taking their focus away from the, from the project. You might even have a business analyst, and that person might be supporting the product owner around developing user stories, so you might have that, but they may not be part of the uh, core team. They may be on the outside support role only. So, I mean, this is one scenario, but, but again, where you would see this is when it's a small, straightforward project and you can get this job done uh, fairly quickly with a pretty small team. Uh, here's a, a more likely scenario. It's a large project and you might have multiple scrum teams working uh, just because of the size of the project and the fact we got to get it done within a certain time frame. And in this case, you've got uh, potential for having either a project manager, or as I call it, a project scrum manager, um, over the overall project. Now, um, I've seen it done both ways, where that overall person is a project manager or a scrum manager, uh, and basically it's a scrum master who sort of has authority over all the different scrum teams. But what you have in this situation is a, a scrum of scrums. Now, I'll give you an example of a job I was involved with. You know, these, these scrum team would have a, a morning get-together and talk about um, what's happening, what was accomplished, what's going to be done over the next day, uh, what interface problems do we have, what obstacles are in our way. Well, uh, what happened on this job was then the scrum masters would get together uh, at 10 o'clock for coffee because their teams were meeting at 8 o'clock and by, by 10 o'clock they'd get together and talk about what's going on with each scrum team. And again, same thing. What did our team accomplish? What's being done over the next day? Uh, what problems, what issues do we have? And how can you guys help us? So that's another way of organizing for what I call a larger project, and that's by having multiple scrum teams. Now, here's another example where you have a big project, but you have a mix of scrum and waterfall. Now, where would you use something like that? Well, okay, let's assume it's a big project and there's an infrastructure component. You got new desktop computers, maybe a new server. Well, quite frankly, there's no need to do those infrastructure pieces using an agile approach, not necessary. So they, they might be done with a waterfall approach and the custom built software might be done using the scrum teams. And, and maybe there's another piece of software where it's an interface and an upgrade to the software. Well, we can do that with a waterfall approach also. So here's a situation where you might have a program manager or a project manager if it's just one project. And you have different teams working on different parts of the project or 
like we're showing here, a program of different projects being done as part of that program. All right, in review, uh, Agile, yeah, it's an iterative framework. And the key is that, yes, requirements and solutions evolve. If you've got a job where you know the requirements up front, you don't need Agile, really. You could use that with a waterfall approach, and it'll work fine. Number two is that Agile is an umbrella term. Now, there is no quote-unquote Agile methodology. There's different types of Agile methodologies, feature-driven design, Scrum, Kanban. So there's specific methodologies that fall under that Agile umbrella. And Scrum, point number three, is a specific framework. And uh, it's really geared, again, with small, close-knit teams. I mentioned seven to nine people, pretty normal to develop products and services. All right, here, I want to finish up with just some examples of reference books that are out there that um, are, are pretty good reading. And I've read all these books. Um, all were very helpful, very useful. Um, number two is a quick read. So if you're looking for a real brief introduction, that's that's the one you want to go to. But all of these can help you uh, learn best practices in doing Agile projects. All right, at this point, let me turn it back over to Justine. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, at this point, we have time for a few questions. First question we have, Joe, someone says, considering the Y2K events and the original meeting of software developers, can you give your insight about the movement into Agile? Is the momentum of Agile principles from part of the delay of the stakeholders' acceptance of iterative expectations from that period of time preparations? That's a, that's a long question. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay, I'm looking at the question in the chat box here. Um, Actually, I was involved in Y2K. It was very interesting. And um, I, I'm thinking back to what we did with Y2K, and, I, and quite frankly, um, I I don't think um, that helped drive the move to Agile. I, I really don't. Because quite frankly, Y2K was all about fixing computers so that when they went to year 2000, for those that are not familiar with this, that when they went to year 2000, uh, computers would still work. Because the problem was uh, the older computers simply had the year as two digits. So with Y2K, you're going to a new century. And that was considered a problem. And quite frankly, again, I was heading up a... Um, portfolio of projects, and we were looking at a huge, huge expenditure uh, to deal with this Y2K issue. And maybe you want to say we use agile techniques. Well, we use out-of-box thinking because, quite frankly, a lot of the computer systems we were dealing with were in manufacturing. And when we looked at the potential bill for replacing all these systems, it was a lot of money. And, and quite frankly, what we did, we said, wait, wait a minute. What if we just turn the clocks back? Who cares? It's a manufacturing computer. It doesn't really matter if the year is right, so who cares? That's what we did. We basically turned the clocks back on those computers uh, to give us more time to replace them over a longer time period. So the movement into Agile, my, my, again, what I said earlier, uh, again, I, I worked on product development. I worked for a Fortune 100 company, and I was working on digital projects in particular. Quite frankly, um, with digital, things were changing so rapidly that we, we went to an agile approach. You, you could not define a new product and the features and go through a waterfall methodology to get that thing in, into manufacturing because things were changing so rapidly. So uh, we were using agile. And again, it got to a point where you had a cutoff saying, okay, we got to go to we got to go to production. We got to start making the product. 
So if you got another great idea, it's too late. It's got to wait till the next next release of this product. But what really, in my opinion, drove Agile. Um, again, I was involved in a lot of IT projects. There were some huge failures in, in IT projects, and again, there were large IT projects, uh, multiple years, very large initiatives for companies, and they were failing um, from a, a functionality, cost and schedule standpoint, and they were using that waterfall. And again, as I said, my, in my opinion, my experience is if you put in a project, a software, custom-built software project over a year long, and you're using waterfall, you will fail. You will, because things change too quickly. So the beauty of Agile, again, again it's just getting things into the, into production, not going through this whole waterfall process. And remember the slide I showed earlier? Um, we, we did that kind of stuff, too. We also did what I call incremental waterfall, you know, multiple releases. And that's what Agile is all about, multiple releases, getting product to market quicker. So... Yeah, my, my opinion, Agile was a response to the need in product development to get products to market and handle changing requirements, and number two, to make software development projects more successful. Great. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, we're running a little over on time, but um, we'll have time for one more quick question. Um, someone would like to know... Um, do you recommend getting the PMI ACP certification to get into managing Agile projects? Uh, my answer is yes. Um, you you can get, I'm a certified Scrum Master, but quite, quite frankly, uh, that's just taking a two-day class and passing a test. Uh, the, the PMI one, I, I like that one in particular because it does require the experience. They make you prove that you have so many hours of experience doing agile projects. It's the same as the PMP. The PMP requires so much experience as a project manager. So I would recommend the PMI ACP certification. Yes, if you're managing the agile projects, that's the way to go. Great. Thank you very much, Joe. That's all the time we have for today, but if you had a question that we weren't able to get to, please feel free to send us an email at pmtraining at pmcentersusa.com. We will provide an answer for you.